Welcome back. You're still with us here on Young Turks, and we're talking about the D2C market with, Chana, with Chaitanya Ramalinga Gaude, the co founder at Wake Fit, Shashank Sina, the CEO of Drool's Pet Food, and Suklina Neja, the CEO of Good Brands, the Good Glam Group. Uh, Chaitanya, let's address the issue that Suklin left us with just before we took that break, and that is the issue of commoditization, the issue of competition, and the issue of stickiness. Now, uh, you know, from your own experience, I want to understand uh, you don't have the ability to hit the market with unlimited number of SKUs, etc. So, you know, what do you chase? Who do you chase? At what price point do you chase? I would imagine this is different for different categories. But explain to me what your lessons have been on that front and what would you suggest somebody who's scaling up a D2C business today to focus on? Sure, Shiri. I think um, as a D2C founder, the easiest uh, temptation is to raise a lot of money and get most of your revenue from uh, third party marketplaces uh, as well as through uh, general trade. I'm seeing recently that a lot of D2C founders are going offline through the general trade and modern trade channel as, uh, as young as when they are 50 crore, 100 crore in annual turnover. Uh, and the, but I please note, I call them temptations because that gives you revenue, but mm. that probably will give you uh, the right foundational building blocks for scale. Uh, the biggest thing that you can do as a, uh, as a founder is to build your own website, your own app, and ensure that you have a very strong connect with the customer pre and post purchase. Uh, for example, in a category mm -hmm. like ours with sleep and furniture and home solutions, customers have a lot of doubts. Uh, how does it uh, fit uh, fit into my home decor? How does it fit into my, with other, other furniture yeah. that I have? Uh, how do I know that this particular mattress works well for me? How do I know this sofa is not, the fabric is good quality? Uh, and there's a ton of doubts that they have, which we can constantly uh, use our experts to sort of get their comfort, get their alignment, get their trust. And once that product is delivered and the same trust is delivered upon, we also take a lot of effort to engage with them post sales, uh, which means how did you like the product? Right. How did you like the packaging? Uh, what could be improved? Uh, by the way, this mm. is the care instruction. This is what you can do to extend the life of the product. Mm. This is how you can take care of the hygiene of the product. Mm. That automatically builds a lot of yeah. uh, recall in their minds and a positive association. Uh, today, we have nearly 40-42% of our revenue coming from repeat customers and that's primarily because of word of mouth. Mm. Uh, no amount of uh, uh, marketing dollars can ever uh, take care of that kind of love um, yeah. and our ability to have India's largest furniture factory operate world-class mattress factories, then integrate that value chain to deliver a good quality but highly affordable price point and then identify the demographic and psychographic profile of the consumer and then engage with them pre and post purchase mm. is a mm. is a strategy that we have taken and uh, please note i mentioned psychographic profile because that old classification of looking at your yeah. consumers as yeah. nccs a1 a2 a3 b1 um, looking at huh. uh, what languages they speak which cities they live in i think that is a little bit obsolete and we as marketers also have to look at changing because currently it's a psychographic profile what do they consume uh, mm. What uh, data do they look at before making a yeah. decision? Who do they speak to? Uh, whether it is somebody earning two crore a year or somebody right. earning five lakhs a year, how do they look at value proposition? What is value for money and what is considered right. wasteful? I think a lot of it is behavioral now, and the more and that ability to target them on behavioral does not uh, is not provided by any platform. You cannot go to Google and say I want to look at all people mm. who who have this psychographic profile. You cannot go to Facebook and say, I want to yeah. target people who behave like this or consume this. So uh, the, the thinking mm. of saying mm. everybody can be bucketed into neat demographics and then you can just bombard them with messages mm. uh, may be slightly obsolete. So I, I think this journey has what uh, has taught us. Uh, yeah, it's not just about personalizing product, but it's also about personalizing messaging, uh, as you point out. But let me bring Shashank into the conversation uh, on that uh, same point. Uh, Shashank, you know, uh, for, for instance, as far as uh, your own company is concerned, 
the decision or the decision to sacrifice which price point you should be in and which price point you should not be in, that would have been a strategic decision as well. So as you try and build out getting more and more share of wallet, what's been the experience? Did you start premium and then go mass, start mass and then go premium today? Everybody's talking about the premiumization journey and perhaps on the D2C space, uh, you know, the premium niche uh, might be because of the early adopting fashion, the easier one to crack into. What's been the experience for you? The premium, premium looks very attractive for everybody because you make more money out of the same cost what you're going into in the major structures of services and all. But I feel mass or economy is the one who is going to feed the category actually. So you have to bring the people. In our category, 92% of pet owners still feed home diet. So the first challenge for the brands like us is to bring them into the category with maybe an economy brand or a mass brand. Then upgrade them to a premium product lines which are available. Like in your category, in our category, you see there are products which are grain-free, specialized pet food for obese dogs, specialized pet food for renal affected dogs. So, but this doesn't happen at one go because customers are still used to the home diet because they have seen their generations feeding the same home diet and their dog living for 10 years or 12 years. So the, the difficult part is to change the food habits. I, if belong to North, I will look for a paratha every time, right? So, but same is happens with my pet as well. So we're learning the trend where the customer can come into the category, stay for some time, maybe get into premium line of products in a specific time throughout the year or in the life of the pet. And then once he tries the premium product, stays on it for a longer time because of the value he drives from the premium product lines. So very important to keep feeding the category, keep adding on people, and then upgrading them to the upper categories. Other challenge, what pet care space feels, feels like once the dog becomes an adult, people start thinking that there's no growth coming in and I can manage with the home diet. But we have to understand the nutrition part is very different for a pet compared to what a human gets. So there again, what a product line is going to offer has to be very specific. As Shatina said, like largely how the brand is communicating. I, am I able to tell them what the product line is talking about? What the benefits or the functional benefits of brand is going to deliver? Same product line is available at a pet food is at 300 rupees kg. There's other pet food as 800 rupees kg also. Is the customer understanding the benefits with the price gap? So make adding people through the economy range of the category, let them come to your fold, make them empowered, make them knowledgeable, and then upgrade to the premium category. That's what we have been doing for the last three, four, five years now. Right. So, so, so build out the category to start with before you actually move towards premiumization. But so clean, you know, the point that you were making as far as differentiation is concerned, uh, so that there isn't confusion at the end of the customer as to what they're actually buying into. Uh, and I think this is, this is the dilemma that a lot of founders uh, face, uh, you know, how much should you dabble in what should you dabble? Uh, and sometimes it ends up being a bit confusing at the customer end. Uh, what's been the experience on that front? And as you build, you know, various niches out under the Good Glam Group, what are the guiding uh, levers that you're operating with today? I think great question, Shireen. One of the things we've tried to do at our end is to maximize incrementality. So a large part of our journey's growth has come on the back of acquisitions. So the journey on GoodLam started with MyGlam in 2017. And since 2021 and beyond, we've actually acquired four more brands within the group. And each one of the brands that we picked to join hands with were brands that were extremely distinctive in the space that they were playing with. So whether it was Serona, which was a pioneering brand in femme hygiene, they're today the largest manufacturers of menstrual cups. So it's a category creation job to be done. Or if you look at a business like Momsco, which is a pioneering brand for mom and baby products, but again, within personal care, no one was really looking at the segment of moms and creating bespoke products for them. Or for that matter, when we look at brands like St. Botanica or Organic Harvest, again, they're offering either premium ingredients, which were extremely exotic, or organic certified products. So within the entire portfolio that we built in within the brand's business, one very clear reason to exist was incrementality. Pick a brand that plays A to a segment which it can own, B, ensure that all the brands that we work with are within the clean beauty space because you are today talking to the native digital consumer, people who are willing to pay that premium for buying clean beauty. So again, as a company, have a very clear point of view that you are creating a 
bunch of brands where you are targeting a premium consumer, you are targeting a consumer who will, who's willing to pay that extra for toxin-free, clean products. So I think for us, a guiding principle has been to look at non-overlapping beauty segments and very clear yeah. brand positioning so that we can create incrementality within the beauty and personal care space and having the discipline to not go beyond the field of play that we've identified for ourselves. Yeah. So so, so put, the, put the guardrails as far as the brands are concerned. Very quickly, so clean. Uh, you know, the priority now, as far as the Good Glam group is concerned, leave me with one number, one target that you're hoping to achieve. I think scale with profitability. By when? That would be the mantra that we are following. <laughs> profitability by when? I think we are clearly I mean, targeting for us to get profitable by Q1 of 24. Q1 of 24. Chaitanya, uh, to you, the, the one target that you're going to be chasing after? Uh, customer experience and NPS. During the festive season when we are going to be scaling 2x of orders, still maintaining that threshold uh, would be something that we dream about. And back to profits? We are already a profitable company, so uh, we would want to continue on this journey in a sustainable manner. Okay. Okay. Shashank, the, the one target that you're chasing after? To build up the first multinational pet food brand from India as Droots. Maybe another two years. <laughs> okay. Build the... Another two years to build out India's first MNC pet food company. Uh, uh, four global markets, uh, Shashank, Chaitanya and Sukhleen, many thanks for joining us. We wish each one of you the very best of luck. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights on your own D2C journeys. Uh, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Young Turks from all of us here. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned. The news continues.